Okay. Uh, good morning. Thank you for having me here. And thanks to Professor Robertson von Trotter for inviting me. And thank you also for Robina Zern and uh, Christine Melcher, who made this a very pleasant experience. They even directed me to a very nice cafe in Karlsruhe, which is not an easy thing. And you know, we cosmopolitan sociologists are basically uh, cafe house theorists. Not cafe house terrorists, but cafe house theorists. So uh, thank you for having me. And I read uh, this morning in the paper that your president is urging everybody to speak English to become part of Europe. So this is what we're doing. And this uh, conference is probably also a little bit of a contribution to European integration. And since everybody likes to play devil's advocate, I'm going to play the other way around. I'm going to play God's advocate in this paper. And I think that he doesn't really have that many advocates. And I hope I can make a case. So let me start with a question. Is it really true, as some critics claim, that there is no reality that deserves the title of Europe? That it is merely an idealized form for an elite elitist illusion that does not stand up to critical questioning? And is it not a remarkable sign of nostalgia and introversion that in the age of globalization, the European Union is predominantly preoccupied with its own affairs and is still attempting to define its own political constitution? And this is even more confusing if we take into account that the attempt to what I call to cosmopolitanize Europe was launched after the Second World War in a politically conscious act as an antithesis to a nationalistic Europe and its physical and moral devastation. Um, clearly, at the start of the 21st century, globalization represents a challenge to the integration of the temporal and spatial durability of what it means to be human and social in the modern age. Its history and borders still the only forms is history and borders the, still the only forms of social and cy symbolic integration, is my question. And this begs another question if territorial, geographical, and political distinction like Western or Eastern Europe, or like the West or the East, make it all sense in our day and age. I would like to argue that in the age of globalization, a possibility opens up where cultural and political self-images can be reduced neither conceptually nor empirically to a territorially fixed space and viewpoint. And there's a small paradox at work here. When we talk about memory, for instance, and memory is my subject here, we often see that it is pervaded with a spatially fixed understanding of culture that is rarely remarked upon. That's the concept known in the cultural sciences of collective memory. The territorial conception of culture and society, or memory for that matter, the idea of culture as rooted and limited, constituted through the opposition of the we and them, was itself, and we often forget that, a reaction to the enormous changes that were going on as the 19th century turned into the 20th, and it is still with us in the 21st century. It was a conscious attempt to provide a solution to the uprooting of local cultures that the formation of nation states necessarily involved. The triumph of this national imagination starting in the 19th century can be seen the way the nation state and the corresponding memories have ceased to appear as a project and a construct and has become instead widely regarded as something natural. However, and this is what I want to do now, looking at Jewish memory, we discover a different kind of memory, a traveling memory. This kind of memory is very often based on experiences which can originate spatially in Eastern Europe, but can move and travel from there to Western Europe, to the USA, to South Africa, to Latin America, and to Israel even, while at the same time being able to travel back to Eastern Europe. They could originate in Morocco, in Iraq, and move from there to the East or to the West. It is my argument that one be, what can be called cosmopolitan, multidirectional, or traveling memories are posing challenges to the ideas which bind history and borders tightly together and open up the possibility that this is not the only possible means of social and symbolic integration. 
But, and it is important for me to point this out, I'm not talking about an internal Jewish question here, but about the problematic of European modernity, modernity outside of Europe, and vivid about, this, and vivid about its global significance. I use Jewishness here as a reality on the one hand, and as a metaphor for people on the margins, people who are minorities, whether against their will or by choice. By choice. I also want to look at Jews, not in terms of their victimhood alone, which is often done here in Europe, but to explore the possibilities of autonomous cosmopolitan social and political action. Thus, my argument tries to go beyond the notion that only the memory of suffering can be integrative. It seems to me that Europe at the beginning of the 21st century looks for some shared cultural imageries providing some cultural backbone to the crisis-written currency of the euro. And I'm sort of like commenting on the president's speech from yesterday. What could that cultural imagery look like? Many intellectuals have repeated invoked the seminal role of the memory of the Holocaust as a foundational event for such a shared past, even though they have done it in very different terms. This scenario is only the starting point for my look at the prospects for a new Europe, how they relate to memories of the Holocaust and the cosmopolitan promises attached to them. I'm aware that the concept of cosmopolitanism carries a heavy European burden with it, and that it has become part of a debate about European identity and belonging. My colleague here, Roland Robertson, has talked about this here and has written extensively about the normative problems of the concept of cosmopolitanism, and rightly so. I, am, I myself have become par target of his criticism at times. Thus, we need to be careful not to read too much into that concept, even though I think it still has clear significance inside and outside of Europe as well. What I would like to do here is to talk about the meaning of Jewish memory in this European context, but I'm also quite aware of the fact that the fate of Jewish memory in Europe can also carry some meaning outside of Europe, may say something about modernity as a whole, and may even reopen some questions regarding universalism, globalization, and secularization. So let me start with one very important point. Some people view the Holocaust as the culmination of the history of anti-Semitism. Some see it as the apogee of the history of racism. And some consider it even a crime against humanity. The difference between these points of view are subtle but crucial. Anti-Semitism, as it is commonly now understood, is suffered only by Jews. Racism, a broader category, can be experienced by anyone who is different or other. Crimes against humanity are broader still and may even be considered a crime against the human condition. At this point, questions arise to which there are no quick fire answers. Who are the victims of crimes against humanity? The Jews or humanity? In other words, everybody, including the perpetrators. How can a crime against humanity be perpetrated when humanity is considered by many an empty concept with no substance or content? When even the death of the human subject, long since proclaimed by many post-structuralist and post-modern critics of society, do we not now need to defend the rights of the dead under the banner of human rights, for instance? Do we not, kind, do we not need a kind of cosmopolitan faith? I believe we do. Some people will rebel, will rebel against the idea that secular morality is comparable to religion in any but inessential regards. So long as there is no reference to God, it is thought, we cannot be talking about religion. But this is not true in my view. What makes a secular morality religious is that it rests on faith. At the bottom of it is a set of unquestioned and unquestionable certainties. For example, that equality is good, that democracy is good, that compassion is good, and that suffering is bad. Why do we know these are true? We just do. In other words, we believe it on faith. And this faith defines who we are. If someone declares these ideas are nonsense, we are personally offended and easily outraged. 
What do I mean? I mean values that are emotionally engaging, that connect, that descend from the level of pure abstract philosophy into the emotions of people's everyday lives. It is by becoming symbols of people's personal identities that normative cosmopolitan philosophy becomes a political force and a social reality. And it is by embodying philosophy in rituals that such identities are created, reinforced, and integrated into communities. But we still have not solved the pitfalls of normativity. I'm aware of that. So far, so good. So what I will try to argue here is against the paradoxical results of a European cosmopolitan model based on a universalized understanding of the Holocaust that does not take into account the particular experiences, in this case, of European Jews even before they became victims. There exists indeed a normative Kantian conception of cosmopolitanism rooted in a universalism that has no conceptual and no actual space for the persistence of particular attachments. And I think yesterday evening we were listening to one very strong example of that kind of universalist thinking. Thus, and this will be my argument, if one excludes the particular memories of the Jews, or other particular memories for that matter, one risks falling back on a conception of either cosmopolitanism or multiculturalism, which are both rooted in a universalism that has no conceptual or actual place for the persistence of particular attachments. We just cannot get rid of them. Thus, the universalist narrative obliterates the cosmopolitan potential of the Jewish experience, for instance, which moves between the spaces of universal identifications on the one hand and particular attachments on the other. In addition, the universalist narrative does not leave any space for conflicts and irreconcilable differences in the interplay between memory and identity, which lies at the heart of the European project and not only there. That's what I want to do is to look, and this connects it to the talk we heard before, how people in civil society negotiate new forms of memory and move away from universalism in its neglect of particular experiences. That's what I would like to do is to give Jewish voices in a, in a, pol a political space in the European narrative, trying at the same time to transcend the division between Europe and non-Europe. This also presents another historical version of cosmopolitanism. And at the same time, I think that uh, Roland's notion of globalism comes to mind here, alerts us to the cosmopolitan potential of the recognition of particularism could yield in the context of Europe's ethno-cultural religious diversity. By bringing Jewish experience into the equation, universalism and particularism cease to be mutually exclusive categories. A unified European memory should recognize that divided memories, a unified European memory should recognize that divided memories result inevitably from different experiences. And there's nothing wrong with divided memories or narratives. They are not noise in an integrated system. They do not need to be overcome and become united. Common narratives are not common in the sense that everybody would tell the same story. Instead, the recognition of the different narratives is the crux of the matter here. It primarily involves a kind of conflict-written history in which various groups linked across national boundaries and cleavages seek to live the conflict without necessarily trying to overcome it in quest of a common narrative without ever hoping to reach it. Consequently, we need a concept of the public we need a concept of civil society where divisions can unite and where indifference and even social distance can contribute to society's integration. One gets at times the impression that just when people talk of European expansion, they largely try to ignore the divergent historical memories of existing and prospective EU member states. And if they don't ignore it, they see it as something that prevents European integration. Faced with such non-recognition, new member states, new member states, 
New members, as I'm negotiating <laughs> while I'm speaking, so new member states in the East and also in the South seek legitimacy for their particular experiences and memories, most notably by displacing the Holocaust with their own victimhood under Stalinism in Eastern Europe or Francoism in Spain, just expands it. Just examples. Thus, on first sight, it seems that they tell a di that story from a different angle, even though it's often not a very dissimilar story. Sometimes national comparisons can blur the vision for the common ground. As the Western European presumption that narratives of the Holocaust would provide the foundation for shared European identity, see crimes against humanity, has clashed with the mer memory politics of post-Stalinism, post-Francoism, state-imposed commemorative practices have become the subject of theory debates, you know them, contributing to the renationalization of European memories, which in turn is, of course, divisive. Civil war victims in Spain, Jewish victims in Poland, victims of uh, Bolshevism in the Baltic states, victims of Stalinism, of course, they do not tell the same story, but they all tell a story of haunting and persistence of the past into present. They actually tell ghost stories. And if you agree with me that memory is about storytelling, we can definitely find common ground even as binary discourse celebrates Western universal post-nationalism and condemns the persistence or return of ethnic, religious, or national particularism in large parts of Europe or anywhere else. And you would agree with me that memory activists are basically storytellers. I see that every time I do my research in Spain, when people sit around the exhuming the bones of civil war victims, and they tell stories. They tell stories about their grandfathers, they tell stories about their grandmothers, they tell stories about the village in the 1930s and all that. In my opinion, the central problem with prevalent visions of Europe is they tend to denigrate all particularism as an affront to its post-national vision of politics. However, more is at stake here. The deep politicized memory of the Holocaust, for instance, perceives of Jews as helpless victims alone, as respective citizens of various or European states which were singled out by the Nazis for extermination. This is, of course, true, but it is not a whole story. There's another aspect to the European Jewish experience before the Holocaust which seems to play no role at all in the current politics of memory. And what I mean is that a central facet of the Jewish experience in affinity with the currency of cosmopolitanism in the global age is the diminishing significance of territorial attachments. Current manifestations of post-national, multi-ethnical, and transnational ties have long been an integral part of the Jewish experience. And clearly, and I want to make this uh, important point here so there won't be any confusion, Israeli and Jewish memories are not the same, even they do overlap at times. Israeli memories run along national lines and are much more similar to national contained memories as we encounter them, especially in Eastern Europe. Israel was just founded just as the new Europe was rising from the ruins of World War II, you know the story, and for many Europeans, the particular experience of the Holocaust has been dislodged from its historical context and inscribed as a universal code of suffering, which is, of course, not what happened in Jewish memory and, of course, also not what happened in Israeli memory. A striking example of that is how the memory of, Hol of the Holocaust has, for instance, traveled to Argentina in its dealings with dictatorship and its aftermath. The report on the so-called desaparecidos the ones who were disappeared by the dictatorship is called nunca mas, never again, ni vida, directly borrowing the use of this term from the Dachau monument. And you know very well how much the German term ni vida carries very particular sound. Argentinian artists like Julio Flores uses silhouettes to memorialize the victims of Argentinian dictatorship by consciously copying posters he encountered in Auschwitz. Through the use of Spanish, Argentinian memory is traveling back to Spain 
and influenced Spain's own dealing of the past of the Civil War. That's how Holocaust memory is actually coming to Spain, not through Europe, not through January 27, but it's coming to Spain via Argentina and the mediated memory of there. These processes of traveling, multidirectional, cosmopolitan memories challenge the notions of divided European memories and provide a new point of view. By emphasizing the traumatic and subsequent therapeutic dimension of this process, the dividing line between perpetrators and victims, as well as distinction between historically specific specificities and universal applicability is, fre applicability is frequently blurred. So I'm coming slowly to the end. Is cosmopolitanism based on Jewish experience at all possible? The diaspora was never nor is it now a closed culture. Jewish culture has always mixed with other culture. If one understands culture as something heterogeneous, open to the outside, then one can see how the newly emerging cosmopolitan culture is becoming Jewish. At the 19th and 20th centuries, the Jewish diaspora experience and its cosmopolitan exponents we had antipodes to the national territorial forms of memory constitutive of the European nations. Today, identification with a group, be it ethnic, national, religious, whose historical roots lie outside the spatial and temporal coordinates of the adopted homeland, is often a matter of preference and not infrequently of pride. The Jewish diaspora can serve as a paradigm for deterritorialization as such. A particular awareness of place and the relation to being other are played out in immediate experimental level. Actual Jewish culture was not only mixed with other cultures, it was itself a mixture of cultures. In a certain sense, its cosmopolitanism lay in Judaizing the mixtures of cultures it absorbed. It gave them a unifying cast without negating them. Maybe this was exactly what the Nazis feared so much and even called it the Jewification of culture, the Verjudung der Kultur. Thus, the experience of diaspora, of life in exile, is the clearest example modernity offers of a sustained community life that does not need a territorial container in order to preserve its history. A cosmopolitan theory of memory is not about competing, competing claims to victimhood, nor is it about providing that the destruction of European Jewry was unique. A cosmopolitan memory of the past emerges from the conscious and deliberate inclusion of the other's particular experiences, not from the idea of some community of fate inspired by mythical delusions and serving to construct some false historical continuity. This is exactly where the tension between cosmos and polis is located between citizenship in the world, European vision, and Jewish experience. Cosmopolitanism is not just folklore. It's a political space that cannot exist without pluralism. Thank you very much.